Good morning and uh, thank you very much for having accepted my invitation. Actually, this is for the first time that I'm doing such an interview concentrated uh, on education in, uh, uh, in, Middle, in Middle Orient, in, especially in Yemen, because I don't know too much about uh, this geographical area and also about uh, educational conditions uh, uh, in uh, this uh, uh, side of, in this part of world. Uh, but it's very interesting for us to know more and better about such a topic, considering that uh, it's much easier in Europe to put in practice, uh, practice education and different uh, educational standards. But because of the poverty, maybe, I'm not quite sure, it's much more difficult uh, to um, uh, implement a different uh, educational and pedagogical strategies. But before we start to discuss all these uh, technical issues, so be, please, I would be very grateful to you if you could present yourself and uh, telling us more about uh, your activity, because uh, it would be very interesting and necessary for our listeners to, to better know you. OK, first, uh, good morning, too. And thank you, Tudor, for having us uh, as a representative of VTY, of course. Uh, my name is Fatima Ahmed. And I am actually the founder of VTY and I'm trying my best to do uh, as much as possible for the initiative. Let's uh, just say it's still in its beginnings. Uh, we are more concerned about the educational movement here in Yemen. So, yes, uh, it, it's a new trend and a new focus on the educational side of Yemen, actually. So we are trying our best to uh, like uh, invite volunteers from all around the world to have some classes, online classes teaching Yemenis here. You already know that we have a big problem related to war and it is actually very difficult to have uh, new staff inside. Okay, the educational uh, level in general is deteriorating uh, worse to worse every year. And so we are trying to come up with something at least to participate okay, or to have a solution, even if partially to help in this situation. But as I said, we only work on the educational side, online tutoring. Uh, we are trying to be in contact with those who are interested in volunteering from all around the world and those who are interested in learning from Yemen and just get them together, have them both in contact to learn and teach. Uh, I would be very happy to find out more details about um, about the situations of the school of universities, if, uh, if uh, it might be possible in Yemen and uh, in general in uh, this side of the world, because um, as I uh, told before at the beginning of our dialogue, Considering we are living here in Europe, or in, in general in Western societies, um, education is something very normal. It's not, it's not something uh, exotic uh, as it might be probably in Africa or in India or in other, uh, in the so-called third world, as uh, it is called by uh, some specialists. And this is why I would be very interested to know how, uh, what kind of strategies do you have in uh, implementing education in your society and uh, what are actually uh, children rights to education. Can we talk about something like that? Because I, I repeat, it's very important for us to know that. Yes. Uh, the, our problem is actually, let's say it's rooted. Uh, so it, we cannot just link this to something that is recent. But let's say uh, even before the first revolution in 2011, we cannot claim that the level of our education was in its best. OK, we always had challenges about teaching people, about many areas having no schools, about uh, girls uh, not being taught, OK, or not giving the right to attend school, not allowed to. All of this, OK, was like, say, let's say it's a known challenge and a very known problem that we were always trying to solve. But the problem is after the revolution and then the civil war that started in late 2014, early 2015, things got really worse, you know, with the displaced people from places to others, 
and saw the level of education decrease uh, the number of primary, even and secondary schools, according to the UN, over 20 percent already closed. So imagine we are already in a very difficult situation. We are already struggling to teach and we are already struggling to, you know, get everyone uh, learning in schools and then such situation makes things worse for all of us. And so you can find now a lot of children out of schools. And according to one of the recent uh, statistics about the UN, it's over 2 million children that are out of school currently in 2022. So that's scary, you know, because a lot of them are no longer in their own towns. OK, and the problem is it's very difficult to say that the. Let's say the solution or the government is trying to solve this actively. We know everyone is trying to do its best, even uh, NGOs. You know, some of them are involved in the educational field, but we can never claim it's enough. Because uh, the whole situation is all uh, connected problems. Uh, and so now more children are out of schools, uh, more girls are denied the right to education, uh, very difficult to find professional people who can teach. Uh, those who are good are migrating outside the country. So how can we solve all of this? It's like a, a very big cycle that is very difficult to break. And so let's say everyone should be trying from its side to solve this problem, but it's definitely very difficult. I understand the situation um, uh, due to the civil war that took place in 2014. Unfortunately, in Europe, uh, people uh, haven't spoken too much about that. I found out more information on CNN because I'm and, uh, on a French television, which is called uh, France 24, because I'm a French speaker and I uh, watch international press watching to, to this uh, post television. And um, uh, of course, I understood what it was talking about, but uh, how actually has this war, the civil war, destroyed somehow education in your country? Can we talk about can we talk about something like that, or would it be wrong to to highlight such a, such a topic in our discussion? Uh, uh, it's okay, no problem about that. It's not like uh, I'm an expert in politics, but I will just give you like uh, an idea as an educator and how that affects me. OK, for example, in BTY, we have no prejudice over where you are right now. We know that a lot of things are now which part of the country you are in. I mean, because we already have, let's say, four parts of the country now, two governments. OK, uh, one of them in the north, one of them in the south, and we have the separatists and we have uh, parts of our country and uh, let's say foreign entities. And so the situation is highly complex now in VTY as our vision is uh, to provide opportunity for everyone. I think if you can, based on your application as a volunteer in our, uh, in our initiative, we have uh, no indications, no requirements, not for the volunteers, where you are from or what your religion is or what your political you know, uh, inclination is and same is for our students. OK, so we are trying to have our opportunities distributed all over the area. But the thing is, it's very difficult to get this to everyone you want. Now, let's say in education, regardless of the government you are under. OK, to what extent you are supported. Of course, we can see now that even the good students are very difficult to find scholarships, you know, uh, not even supported properly. And even if we have big corruption problem where these opportunities are given to those who don't deserve, you know, so this is in terms of the government, plus the government is so busy with war. How do we expect that they actually focus on the educational field? Sometimes there are more urgent problems, even though we know education is like is is the solution, you know, is the solution for having uh, an educated generation 
people who understand what they need to do and what to do to get the country on its feet again. But we all know that during war, governments, NGOs are more interested on providing food, you know, providing clothing, you know, all of these basics, uh, providing water, electricity. And we know these are all vital, you know, elements, vital uh, requirements for people to live, especially those who are keeping being displaced from one place to another. But education is very important. Let me give you just a very simple example for someone I know, someone who already moved in three camps, you know. So imagine you are displaced from one city in the north and then suddenly you are near to the south, but your camp is not even inside the government rate, outside, isolated, no water, no electricity, and then NGOs will be working on this for three years to provide just basics. Now, imagine after how long a school will be established in such place and how many years are lost. Now, this person who have moved in three camps, their children don't even have certificates because suddenly another military, you know, the opposing military forces are taking over the area. Suddenly the school is closed. The camp is also displaced. And then you have no certificates of what you studied. You have to start over. So you will find someone who is 18, but still in sixth grade. How come? You know, but, but at the same time, we cannot say this is not happening. And then once you shift to another camp, there will be years until they, they are provided with sufficient water supply, sufficient electrical supply, you know, all of these things. And then also schools. So we always know that education is not is a priority yes but it's never number one this is uh, this is in itself a big problem and it's affecting like a huge number very huge number of these uh, new generations so what's the solution to this our government trying both governments are they trying ngos is this a priority to them and who and when what's the plan and people themselves, the educators, you know, educators in our countries are not paid for months. Now imagine someone providing for a family of four. Let's just say this is, and this is not very common, by the way. We will be having like five, six, seven, <laughs> as the Arabic culture is. Now imagine a person like this who doesn't have any income for already three, four months. And after these three, four months is giving like, a simple percentage of what he has that doesn't even, I mean, it's not even good to cover the gap between the exchange even rate that is now between what we were before the war. So professionals, educators, can we blame them? They cannot teach. They cannot depend on teaching. They have to go for other choices. They have to support, provide for their families. So governments are so overwhelmed and so interested in politics. One government is going, another government is coming, keep changing because nothing is working. You know, professionals, they cannot actually do the job because they are busy doing, I mean, fighting for themselves, for their families and students are lost. What can they do? No schools to go, no proper schooling situation, actually, not even the basics sometimes. For schooling and they, they they suddenly or eventually, even if they continue their education, imagine the level of education, the level of proficiency in what they study. Do we expect it to be high? What do we expect? Did we give them so we can actually expect something in return? So it's, a, I, as I told you, it's a, a huge cycle that it's very hard to break, that in order to be broken, everyone has to participate. Governments have to actually put education, prioritize education. NGOs have to also, we as educators have to participate as much as possible, even though, for example, VTY, we have, you have no idea how challenging it is. You know, imagine 
in a country where they are trying their best to have steady electricity supply and steady water supply, how difficult for them to just buy internet connection? How expensive is the internet connection? And how good is the internet connection? And so VTY doesn't have just the normal challenges. It had because we can provide educators from here, but we don't offer something new, right? Especially in terms of languages and uh, terms of contact with other cultures. So online was the solution, but at the same time, online learning, teaching and learning is challenging for the students. So it's a very difficult task, but we are trying our best to pull off. Considering uh, your your entire activity and the situation of education in Yemen and not only in Yemen, but in many other countries uh, that are alongside, um, could you talk about any help uh, or support that you have received, uh, as for example, from uh, United Nations or from different international organizations just to support the education in Yemen and the children's rights to education? Uh, there are, there are many, yes. The problem is it's uh, no longer enough, you know, because the situation now, war has touched almost all areas. Now in the north, you have a government entity and war, okay, a new ideology. And here in the south, you have the same thing. In Aden, which is also part of the south, you have separatists who have their own ideology, their own strategy, their own goals, you know. It's uh, it's even difficult for the NGOs, you know, to organize. Imagine you have offices in the south, in the north, in all areas. How difficult for you to to do whatever you are supposed to do, okay? Under these three governments or three entities. It's it's uh, extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult even for them. But as I said, even in camps, they always establish schools. So, for example, in a camp uh, already started in two, two and a half years. They already have now a school like six months ago that they established. So they will start, for example, now they settled in this camp. Then they will start working on establishing a primary school and then they will start teaching secondary students, okay, and so on. But at the same time, imagine the resources that they have. Imagine the professionals that they they need to provide, okay? Imagine how good is this going to be in helping these people. Uh, so let's say they are teaching two periods of time, primary and secondary in the same day. So limited to certain subjects, uh, they had to take one year in almost four months to make up just so because the children are so behind because they are already late two years, for example, because of the transition. So they need to make up for this before the new academic year starts. So that you will teach them a grade in four months. So what do you expect in four months? Children in grade four are not able to read and write properly. So, of course, they won. But at the same time, they need to learn. They need to educate. So they are trying very hard to uh, do this, especially in camps. So all these NGOs are trying their best. Yes, we know that. We know it's not enough, but we know they are trying even inside. For example, here, even in private schools, they are offering tutoring classes in the afternoons to help those in secondary schools, especially with the scientific subjects like biology, uh, physics, chemistry, uh, math, you know. But all of these efforts, as long as the war is going on, OK, as long as the situation is not being solved, as long as new problems are coming up every month and every time, it's very hard even for the NGOs to do their jobs. So yes, no matter what you do, you still have a great challenge to outcome. 
uh, to overcome. So this is a, a very huge problem. I understand from this point of view how school is going on in Yemen and uh, maybe most of the schools are in camps as far as I understood by now. But, in uh, some areas, yes. Yes, in some areas, not everywhere because it could be impossible. Uh, thank God uh, there are uh, some schools also in the institutional meaning of the world. But uh, what's the situation of the universities in your country? That would be a very interesting subject uh, and topic to know. Uh, we have many students uh, in Romania, for example, come on, coming from Yemen, from India, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, and even uh, during communist regime, Ceausescu accepted many students coming from all these countries. And uh, in our days, most of them are not only here, are not uh, only studying here in Romania, but also in France, in England, in Germany, and so on. Uh, because they are, um, as for example, I have spoken with a Yemeni student uh, some years ago and he told me, yes, I would uh, have wanted, I would have enjoyed studying in my country, but there are no uh, great universities and I uh, couldn't study what I wanted. And this is why I came to Germany, because Germany offers me much more possibilities. So tell me please about, uh, about this topic too. What is the situation, the, the actual, the present situation of uh, university level in your country? Uh, now, let's say, I will give you an example. Okay, of course, this is with uh, the support that we are getting in the university. So as an example, for example, this in the south, there is an area called Marib, where is the conflict, a center of conflict, let's say. So in this area, this one, this area had only thousands population, okay, let's say 30,000, 300,000. Now they are over three, over 3 million, imagine, in in matter of years. Now this, let's just say this is an explosion of population in this area because a lot of people are running in here, okay. They are all, let's say, pursued and they, they had only this area as a refugee, okay. So, you have a big problem. You have no schools, okay, to take such a, a big number of students and no university. One university that was established long time ago, in, it had only a very small number. So this university had, let's say, three majors, okay, for example. Now it's serving thousands of students. They need to offer, offer so many uh you know specializations they have to start opening things they need uh, support so for example in the in this university there are uh, there are let's say uh, buildings and projects being established and so, uh, supported financed by for example some saudi or kuwaiti organizations or even other ngos okay but what do we expect now with such a huge number of students trying to learn with this public university being the only university around here? So they cannot accommodate, okay? They cannot even accommodate. All halls are busy, you know? You cannot find sometimes a hall if you need it. So, with such things, if you are offering so many specialization, do you think you will be providing the tools needed for this one? Do you even you will have a proper library for this one? Of course not. Even it's it's even extremely difficult to have lecturers around here. Number one, it's an area of conflict. Everyone is scared to come into. Now, I will give you myself as an example. I am master students in he, in this university. Okay, I finished my courses in the first year. Now I am in the first year, I'm supposed to be doing my thesis. I am waiting for already one semester. They cannot find someone, they cannot attract, you know, talented or qualified professionals to come and supervise these students. Now with one semester lost, nothing, no news about this. What's the solution? Nothing, we can do nothing. We have to wait. So you you try your best to offer new programs. You try your best to have this as much as organized as possible, even if not successful, 
in so many times. But at the same time, it's very difficult to attract people who can actually supervise people, who can teach, because this is extremely difficult for this area. So it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge because it's uh, it's not just about, about providing the place. OK, it's not just even though it's basic, by the way, what is it going to be in our universities? Whiteboards. <laughs> That's it. Whiteboard and a hole. But you need building, you need uh, uh, tools, you need uh, lecturers. And even if you were able as NGO or entity to come and help, you know, with the buildings and these basics. So how are you going to convince professionals to come here? to teach here in this, and it's very, very difficult to, in, in, at this point, to actually invite lecturer from our, lecturers from outside the country. Imagine this is a, this is a, a big no-no, impossible. Where are you bringing them? Yemenis themselves are having difficulty moving from one place to another. Those in Sana'a cannot come into Marib. Those in Marib cannot come into Sana'a. You know, these are in Aden uh, cannot come into Sana'a. So it's extremely difficult and we have nothing to do. Some things are very difficult to solve and we have to just try our best to solve these issues one by one, step by step, because we cannot just say, hey, we don't have the resources. We don't have the ability to pull this off. And so no need. We cannot do that, you know. Uh, we have university students are waiting to learn. This is their right. Education is supposed to be a right. We don't need to, uh, you know, follow, ne negotiate, uh, try our best to get our right. This is supposed to be something basic, just like water and electricity. Uh, but this is the thing. It's uh, very difficult. We we. In, I know it's very difficult for people sometimes to developed countries to understand how difficult it is to just have a classroom. Simple, simple classroom. Forget about technology. Forget about people having computers. Just basic. That's that's what we are working on at the time being. Maybe the question I'm going to ask now is not a suitable one, and if you want, uh, if you don't want to respond, I understand very well. But uh, it's just a personal curiosity, taking into account everything you are doing right now as a as a teacher, as an educator. As far as I understood, by now it's not that easy to study to um, to 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 get to get a degree, a scholar degree in your country. How actually did you manage to do that, to become an educator, considering that there are so difficult conditions from this point of view in your country? I see. Um, I'm a bit old already, late 30s. So when I graduated from high school, I, it was like 2004, 2005. And because I graduated as one of the first 10 in the country, <clears throat> at least education was OK back then. If you are one of the first 10, you get a scholarship. I studied in Malaysia for my bachelor. But of course, I cannot support myself because the war started by the end of my bachelor. So imagine our scholarship suddenly suspended for many of us. So we are left there. At that time for years, we have no way to enter the country. It's the time where they just blew up airports, you know, stopped all flights, and even uh, traveling through land was extremely difficult by then. So we had to work, we had to stay for years outside the country abroad. But you get to a point where you know that this situation is going to continue. It looks like it's going to continue, and most probably is not going to end anytime soon based on what we see. And based on how bad it's getting every single year and how complicated things are getting every single year, politically, educationally, everything in all cases. So all you have to do is one of two things. Either you decide to stay abroad, may raise somewhere, or you go back. 
<laughs> and you try your best. So when I came back, I did my I started doing my masters here. Now, a lot of people don't have the opportunity like we did. You know, corruption is everywhere, right? And opportunities are giving to the wrong people uh, everywhere. But let's say now the the, the percentage okay, of pers uh, corruption he is so high. So we cannot claim that those people who deserve these opportunities are getting. And these opportunities are very limited right now because, of course, they are the resources are exhausted. OK, used in war, used to manage only basics, you know, no subtle main things. So education has still limited resources to use. So this is what we are trying to do. And here, I, I'm, me and other educators are just educators are just trying to, let's say, do our part in breaking the cycle. We don't know to what extent is this going to continue, how successful we are going to be, but let's say we are trying from the inside. You as a volunteer and other volunteers are trying from the outside. Everyone is trying to participate as much as he can or she can. But how successful, to what extent can we touch? How many people are we going to help learning? For example, now we are trying to choose those who are going to really benefit from these opportunities, who are, th these opportunities are going to make a difference in their lives. So we are trying to do that. We are trying to do that. But at the same time, we, I mean, how many people are going to be, uh, are going to benefit from this opportunity? Not much, but some from our side, some from other NGOs side, you know, educators side. Bit by bit, we try our best to break this complicated cycle. That's all what, uh, what we are trying to do. Now, considering I'm interested in this topic as well, especially as an European, uh, for me as an European and in general, uh, everywhere, especially in Western Europe, human rights uh, are an essential reality and we are very sensitive when it comes about uh, someone's rights uh, which are not respected. And uh, actually, I regret very well every time I see any kind of discrimination and uh, I am a defender of everything concerns uh, tolerance, acceptance and also human rights. And I am I have promoted uh, human rights by everything I have been trying by now to do, especially through my articles or through my conferences that I uh, held by now. But uh, we know in Europe what the situation of women is from a professional, from a social and also for even from uh, why not from a human point of view, because they are very persecuted as as for example, I know an example in Pakistan, uh, a lady whose name is Malala. I don't remember uh, her surname, I, uh, her, her real name, because uh, I have forgotten being a little bit tired, but I know she ran away from Pakistan just to protect her uh, independence, independence and her human rights to study and to have a profession. So please tell me more about the situation of girls' rights and women, women rights in your country, how much they are respected, or is there any chance in the future for them to be respected and to be uh, protected in society and to become equal with human with uh, men rights? Because it doesn't seem normal to me to be talking about such a topic in our century. Well, we are supposed to the, the whatever, let's say, human rights according to the religion that we follow, Islam, are saved. Okay, we have big problems, and we know that usually in any country or in any culture, usually uh, females are affected the most. You know, females and also children, for some statistics. Now, imagine, for example, not just in here. Even in places or countries like Germany, the the the, the involvement in uh, government is considered one of the lowest. Why? Same thing here in Yemen. When you have no school, what do you expect? Who is going to be denied this right first? Definitely ladies, especially if they are going to travel for long distances. Now imagine a school serving so, I mean, serving a big area. OK, so who is going to travel to the school? Most probably. Who is going to 
giving the right in this culture. You know, in before before even the war started, the revolution started. We have we had areas that are still, you know, denying females the right of education, especially after primary school, especially with the early marriage age. Now, these are problems that we know. These are problems that we know we are trying to solve. But the thing is, the war is making all of this worse. So now for someone who is going to do everything now, now imagine a female trying to study university and she's married. She has children. She has so many responsibilities to do. How are you going to support this female? How are you going to encourage this female to actually pursue her studies? How are you going to convince this female that she needs to participate actively in her country, in the decision making? You know, there are a lot of factors that is, and uh, you get to a point, we have now this, uh, let's say that the attitude of, uh, you have no opportunities actually to use. Now you learned, you finished the university and you are staying at home. You are doing nothing. Even males, they, most of them don't even work in what they studied. Could be, could be st uh, studying something about physics. Okay, finished my studies. I am the first, you know, <laughs> achiever, a topper, first class owner. And then, then suddenly you go. To sell clothes in a shop, then suddenly you go to work on a bus. Why? Because you have no opportunities. This is uh, failing us, both males and females. Okay, so this is the thing. And for females, it's always more difficult. It's always more difficult. It's a. Uh, it's. We cannot say that Islam is encouraging this because Islam has encouraged, you know, science in general learning in general. We had scholars even in the time of Prophet Muhammad and after him. But the thing is, sometimes there are clashes with culture, with what shame, you know, to what extent you can demand, you can ask for your rights. And these are all problems that are very hard to tackle in light of the bigger problems, where you have no opportunities for both males and females, where you have less resources, to have where you have, where people are now depressed and lost faith in the system, lost faith in the government, lost faith in themselves to actually, to, to see, am I going to see a change in this country anytime soon? So definitely. So someone who is trying to establish a family, to support this family, provide for families. So now you find a lot of little projects. You know, a lot of females now are following these little projects, small projects, trying to be funded or go for skills, you know, in manufacturing things, making things. Why? Because right now, jobs support no one. You know, the salary of a lecturer may know support this lecturer and his family for even two weeks. Sometimes some lecturers, their salary is not even enough to pay the rent. So all people, even males right now, are going for things outside, you know, outside the uh, being an employee, government employee in a public institution. No one is going for that anymore. This is a this is more like a voluntary work, you know. All those teaching universities or working in public institutions, this for them is something that they are doing to change the situation. Okay, in addition to their other jobs. Now, females, when are we going to have opportunities only for us? For for females, can you put some focus on having these females learn? having these females uh, participating in the, uh, the, I mean, in the government, in public institutions in general, can you give them the right to that? Of course, we have limitations because our cultures 
let's say, uh, is very sensitive to some kinds of work, jobs, to, let's say, some kinds of, uh, uh, let's say, plans or, uh, let's say, ambitions for the females. Yes, but that doesn't mean that it's entirely prohibited for all. And if you could go through even the social networks, you can see that females are very active in volunteering, in social work, very active in this, very active in the educational field, a lot. If, if you go to schools, if you go to people who are trying their best to make a difference, you will find a lot of females in there. OK, but why? Also in Yemen, you have to know we are not supposed to provide females. It's not my duty. It's the male's duty. And so we have the freedom more to do these tasks, to do these things that we don't actually expect an income. We don't actually expect them to provide. But as we said, it's very difficult. Right now, we need both males and females. We need females to be given their rights. We don't need to, uh, to keep fighting for our rights that we are supposed to have. Children don't need to be denied these rights. Females, the same thing. OK, so we are wasting our time instead of developing and, uh, you know, going into what we uh, are good at more by following the basic rights. Simple life is very hard to achieve. So how about a lady who wants to learn her master's or do her PhD or maybe travel to another uh, government rate to learn? How is she going to be allowed? Do you know now, right now from one uh, part of the country to another, a uh, female cannot travel except with, 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 with what we call mahram, someone from her family. So in there, when she's there, who's going, who is she going to live with? Who is going to support her and provide for her? Who, who is going to support her education? So now imagine with all of these, okay, in hand, of course. Now, the male is more probably to travel and learn whatever he wants to learn. Most probably is going to have that right. Females are going to choose whatever they have. So a lot of things, a lot of things are in there. Yes, hearing that, it's very, very, very sad for me. I hope uh, things will change in the future, but maybe this is just a hope. But the hope dies, dies the last, as you know, and I can uh, keep this uh, hope for me. And I hope uh, United Nations and different, uh, different other, especially European, American institutions, uh, will action and reaction in this way in defending, uh, in defending uh, women's rights and also human rights in general speaking. But I repeat, it's very sad because uh, in other parts of the world, progress is, uh, have been made. But here, probably, there was a certain kind of ignorance uh, from the part of great powers of the world. And maybe this is another consequence uh, and another price um, that is paid. Now I would have uh, uh, one last question because I don't know there is no time, no more time. but. Uh, uh, I want to conclude this interview, this dialogue we um, we have uh, we had uh, today, a very emotional one and a very interesting one. Do you think that through what you are doing, through your entire work, could you be, could you represent a ray of light in your trying, in your try to defend uh, girls' rights to education, women's rights to education, and also children's rights to education, maybe for a better further society in your country? <coughs> Excuse me. Do, uh, are you asking about the initiative that we are yes, supporting your right now? Yes, and your, your work, everything you, you are doing from this point of view, from this pedagogical and from this educational point of view, because it is clear you want to establish something new and you want to put the basis of a new education for the further generations in your country. Yes. So first, it, we already talked about why is it online, for example, to have those who are professionals, volunteers from all around the world to be in contact with the students inside. This is a very important point. However, another point is if we talked about females 
Okay, it's very difficult for them, okay, to keep going or traveling or moving for their education. So we all are also interested in having, uh, let's say, as much as possible from the females involved in this initiative. Are you with me, Tudor? Yes, yes, I hear you very well. Yes. So as I said, females are more, most probably going to be denied the right of education, as we said. And so in our online initiative, we are trying to actually encourage females to enroll. OK, we will always try our best uh, because, you know, uh, the way we dress, the cultural, you know, uh, the habits, uh, the attitudes, this will when you have it inclusive, when you have it inside your house, maybe it's providing an opportunity for some. Okay, even though a lot of people still viewing online, you know, contact as dangerous. And I think you are familiar with this because if I'm not mistaken, it will be generation back or two generations. How did they uh, view internet as a breach of privacy, right? And this is still new to us. So. Right now, it's uh, very easy to encourage males to learn with us online more than females. But we are trying our best because we need them to be involved. We are trying our best to have this to serve them. But it's very, very difficult to involve children. We tried. We tried in our uh, previous intake to involve children. It's very difficult. Why? Because even adults don't have devices. Most of them barely have phones. Most of them graduated from bachelors without even being able to use a laptop. They don't even know how to use. So children don't have that opportunity. So maybe this is in later versions of VTY where you can provide actually a place, an internet connection for people to just come and learn. So this is maybe in later stages, as I said. So in VTY, we are trying to make sure our best okay do our best and make sure that females are giving you know uh, the opportunity through vty not just males we are always trying to have equal opportunities and if we have good intake of ladies or females we will try our best to actually have them with us as much as possible because they don't have opportunities not much elsewhere so yes, e even in, uh, you know, because uh, our learning in most of the tuition centers and stuff, they are gender based, which uh, this is, I think you can still see in some areas in the European areas, uh, males are taught separately from females. We have this. So right now it's very difficult to have the opportunity that you have because you don't have a good number. So. For how many years are you going to wait for a group of females, for example, in some in some, let's say, specializations in some courses? So online learning and because tutoring is one to one or maximum three to one, it's very easy for you to gather three females and get them uh, a tutor to teach them much easier than outside. But still online learning is still a huge challenge for many. OK. Children, as I said, until now, we haven't been successful actually in achieving that. Females, yes, to some extent. Males, our problems with males because they are working most of the time. So imagine most of the, the males are <coughs> working two jobs in the morning and in the afternoon because they need to provide for their families. So they are free in usually at night in the evenings. So that's also a challenge we need to try to find the right match. That's why in when we uh, when new volunteers register with us, they will always find that time is very critical. The information, the details about the time, when what time are you free? OK, so we can have the right match for that. It is a challenge from. All cases because. From all, for all of us as uh, people who actually as admins who run this initiative because we all work for free and we have to we have other jobs to actually support our families and provide for them so 
we are trying our best. It's very difficult to find volunteers who work for free right now because they don't have the time for that. Or it's very difficult for them actually to find the time for that. And it's difficult for the males and the females. Sometimes you find them, they want this opportunity so bad, but they have no stable internet connection. That's, that's our only condition. How are you going to learn online if you have no device or you have no connection? So a lot of people are not given that opportunity because they cannot, they cannot have it. But still, as I said, online learning is something new to us. We need to promote this as a possibility to solve, you know, uh, the current problem. It's a, a very good opportunity, actually. It provides very good opportunities for everyone if they are going to use this properly. And this is what we are trying to do, get these volunteers who are interested in making a difference in all around the world with those who are interested in being better, either in languages or even in the future in other subjects. So if we get them together, okay, if we get them in contact to achieve this goal, to achieve these objectives, it's going to be fruitful in the future because these who are going to learn with us maybe will be teaching others, will be contributing in their societies because their level will be better, their professional life, they will have opportunity to participate in whatever they help them with achieving, with learning. So yes, it's challenging for us. It's challenging for the students and it is challenging for volunteers too. Of course, of course, you need to keep in mind that you will be facing so many challenges for students suddenly uh, having no internet connection, contact suddenly. Sometimes uh, it could happen maybe twice, thrice during the year. Suddenly internet is just down in a big area of the country and you have no contact with this with your student so it requires patience from all of us that we, in order to change the mentality about online education in order to get everyone to use these opportunities in order to achieve what we are planning to achieve but of course time and effort Sure, you are definitely right, and uh, I repeat, uh, we should uh, keep uh, our hope alive, and uh, probably in the future everything will be changed. Anyway, world, uh, world changes and people change from generation to generation, and I'm convinced in the future it will be much better. Uh, thank you again for uh, sharing with us all this information about uh, education in your country, and uh, now it's much more clear to us, or at least to me, what uh, kind of efforts do you have uh, to implement a, and to, to put in practice different educational strategies? And uh, I uh, congratulate you for your efforts and uh, uh, good luck in everything uh, you are doing and especially in your project uh, in uh, helping and providing uh, education for children, for females, for males, for uh, everyone who needs uh, to make this step on this road. Thank you again and I wish you good luck in the future. Thank you for the opportunity, Tudor. Thank you for your interest in shedding light, you know, on this uh, side of the problem, the educational side of our problem. And thank you for everything. Thank you, Hassan. Goodbye. Have a nice day. You too. Thank you.